Hello and welcome to another late night talk. My guest this evening is Alex Darwin. He's the author of The Combat Codes, which is coming out very, very soon from Orbit Books. Thank you for joining me, Alex. Thank you for having me, Stephen. I really appreciate you inviting me on. And yeah, it's we're we're getting I don't know when this is gonna come out, but it might the book might already be out. Okay. Um, as listeners are hearing this, uh the 13th in the US and the 15th in the UK. Okay, yeah. So like the, the week this comes out, it will be out within days. So you'll be able to go out and get yourself a copy. And of course, we're just saying the Broken Binding have done a special edition of the combat codes, and there are still some copies available. I know because I know the people who work there. So, but they are going fast, so you need to get on it. I'll put a link down. Man, below. I love I love the Broken Binding edition. They have like the dragon uh, that's on the cover, but it's in foil mm -hmm. um, on the inside. And the book was put out as a trade paperback, uh, which is great. I love that's that's my preferred reading format. But it was really cool to see a hardcover mm -hmm. um, with a jacket and everything. I, I loved it. I actually got to sign them when I was out at the Hachette office, um, Hachette office in the UK. Mm -hmm. So good. It's so good. Just having it on your shelf then is hardback. It, it, it can't be beaten. It's just so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's it's really, it's really cool. A dream. Yeah. So let's let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to some of your kind of early influences. What sort of stuff were you reading as a kid? How did you get into sort of science fiction and fantasy? And was it TV shows and, and films and books or, or what was it? Yeah, so actually, um, one thing I've noticed that most authors say is um, they didn't know authoring was a job or a profession or even there were people that were authors and that that you know I think I have a very similar story um, where I uh, was an early reader of sci-fi fantasy I fell in love with like uh, R.A. Salvatore's books uh, in the Forgotten Realms universe Dragonlance mm -hmm. uh, I just you know ate the, my older brother uh, was always he, who was like our the DM in, in when we were playing Dungeons and Dragons um, he was always reading them and passing them down to me. And I was like bringing them, hiding them away and bringing them to school in my little <laughs> backpack. And um, of course, I didn't know, uh, you know, I love the, I love story. I would create my own fan fiction. Um, I would start writing, you know, in these worlds, in Dragonlands, Forgotten Realms. Um, and uh, it was just for the love of it as as we all start for the love of it and without knowing that uh being an author could be a profession and actually i didn't quite find out until i was you know a young adult that there were authors that <laughs> this is what they did they you know <laughs> you grow up and you can be a firefighter or a or a scientist um or or a chef but not not an author but the local um author who wrote drist um ra salvatore is from uh from the Boston area where, where I'm from. Right. And so I think I, I saw him in a local newspaper, um, like the Boston globe or something. I think he was covered there. And I said, wait a second, that's a real person. <laughs> 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 I had no idea. Like, I just, um, I don't know. Where do these characters, where do they come from? It's just, you know, you know, it doesn't cross your mind as, as a kid. Um, mm. It's just, you're just so engaged in, which is cool in a way. Um, it's yeah. just, you're so engaged in the stories and you're living in them. You're really, uh, it's not about the production and the, the creators. It's about the, what they've created. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that, that was kind of my intro to, to sci-fi fantasy. So apart from sort of doing a bit of fan fiction, when did you start writing novels, you know, properly and sitting down thinking, okay, I want to do my own kind of thing. Yeah, I would say probably, um, it, 20 2010 some somewhere around that that time mm. um you know i had uh i was living out in san francisco and working in um silicon valley i had a i had a startup um that that failed and so that was kind of a creative endeavor in ways but also you know non-creative in a lot of ways as as businesses are and as as we can get to self-publishing mm. um you know how that is running your own business but um, I, I had, you know, been writing on and off and all, still was reading a lot of sci-fi fantasy and thought I'd give it a crack and wrote many things that were, you know, terrible and a, as we all do and, and, you know, shelved many things and finally yeah. hit on something in, uh, 2015 that, that I had enough passion to, to continue pushing and, and eventually self-publish. Ah, so you hadn't actually tried to get any of the other ones out there before Combat Codes? No, and not because I didn't 
again, it, it, that was due to just a lack of knowledge of how, like at that point, okay, there are authors and they're doing this, but I had zero idea of how they became authors. Right. I had zero, zero knowledge of the industry, which is strange because I had knowledge of other industries, Silicon Valley. It just is, a, was a world that was invisible to me, which it, it was kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's true though that there's things that go on all around you until you start to get into them you don't realize how much is involved or how it works or it, it's just you take certain things for granted you know someone does a thing but you don't know how they do it and you know i get that sometimes and i run into different things yeah um, yeah <clears throat> yeah it's just it's just finding your way so you got the book you finished it you're happy with it was it always going, your first idea was straight away to try and like self-publish it? Was that the goal? Yeah, again, originally? kind of like falling into things. I I didn't even know, I, I didn't know there was a distinguishing line between traditional and self-publishing, which seems very silly now. <laughs> uh, but I, again, I, I was working in Silicon Valley. And so I was more, I think I had written this and then I had started reading, you know, a blog post or a Wired magazine article about, KDP. And mm -hmm. I thought, wow, these tools are really great. These are, you know, um, that was the angle I was approaching it from. I said, wow, you can do, you can do marketing and advertising and they have all these tools for, for an author to publish. And I started really going down that rabbit hole. And so it was just almost like, I didn't make a choice. Like, wow, should I be submitting this to agents? I, that wasn't even, I didn't, of course I knew what an agent was, but like not in, in again, not in the respect that you would think that mm -hmm. it was even in my head as a possibility. So I just said, well, I can publish this. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> was it a lot to learn then? Because on top of your own <clears throat> job and family, you've got to you know try and learn the tool. Because one of the biggest differences, I think, between traditional and self-publishing is you run it as yourself as a business. And there's a lot to learn. You have to learn all the tools for promotion, as you were saying, and marketing, but then there's, you know, you choose the editor, you choose the cover, you know, you choose the proofreader, you have to get it onto, Am onto Amazon on KDP. Right, and, right. So was it like a months of working how it all... So you know? I, I, it wasn't in a methodical manner that that was learned. And again, it falls, it really naturally melded with what I had been doing as mm. far as creating a startup. Um, self-publishing really is you're running a business and yeah. that's how you need, if you want to do this as self-publishing as a profession or as some sort of fi financial, um, motivator, you have to look at it as running a business because you're right. You're, you're hiring people, you're creating relationships with contractors, you're doing all the marketing and, and cover design and everything yourself. And it, it's, can be costly and you can spend a lot of money or you could spend less money and you need to make those decisions um, as if you were running a business. But yeah, so I had been running a business and had a startup and, and was no longer having, so it was almost like, okay, here's a new startup. Right. Um, yeah. And so I think that was uh, fortuitous that I was able to approach it or was thrown into just having that approach because that really is now what we've seen you need to do. You can't, uh, I think back in the day, you know, there was kind of like you were able to be discovered more easily because mm -hmm. there was less out there. But especially now to get eyeballs in the self-publishing realm on your book, you need to market and you need to distinguish it. And that's why SPFBO, Self-Published Fantasy Blog Off uh, uh, by Mark Lawrence, um, is so fantastic because that's essentially what it does. It's able to, you know, highlight books um that that have made it through um you know the various judging rounds so we'll come back to F sfbo <clears throat> but you you put out the first book um did you immediately start writing the second one and then go on to the third one were you just kind of like no so um yeah so and it's tough because really the combat codes has had three lives at this point so the right. first was when i so it was, it was first published in 2015. And I, even then I had gone through the basic, um, as I said, you know, creating a small business around this, yeah. but I had, I wasn't, it was still just kind of a side project of sorts. Um, I, you know, still working, I was just starting my family there. So I was extremely sleep deprived, probably <laughs> was, didn't even, I probably didn't even know I had wrote a book at that point. This was child number one. So <laughs> It was like, you know, it, it was, it was just chaos. Um, <laughs> but, and, and we, we were both sleep deprived, but um, 
I wasn't trying to push it that hard at that point. I had mm. the cover, um, the, the first cover, and then it wasn't until, um, and then I kind of let left it. Um, I did, you know, was went on to writing other projects and again, was so distracted with, with um, being a parent mm. at, during that time that it really was not um, a, a priority. Uh, but in 2020, right when the pandemic hit, um, yeah. I, I just by chance, uh, we were all in weird habits during that. We were stuck at home so mm -hmm. often. And so I think I, I randomly came upon the SBFBO. I had not heard of it prior to that. I know it had been running for yeah. maybe five years. I think, yeah, I, I, kind, think of, I kind of reintroduced myself. I said, okay, I have this. It, can I actually um, submit this, even though it had been published prior? And, and yes, it, it was the case um, that I could. And so I submitted it almost on a whim and, and miraculously it made it through to the finals. And that, that was the second life of the combat codes in that I said, okay, this, this might have some legs. And really with the first one, what I had failed to mention was I had really written it um, towards the martial arts community. I, I teach uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That, mm. that was kind of my, uh, my bubble, my sphere was, was martial artists. And I'd written it to that. And so it wasn't until SPFBO that I even realized that the book had legs for sci-fi fantasy fans. Um, and I had not even tried to introduce it to any at that point. And, and so when I found out that the people actually liked the book, um, that's when I had, um, I said, okay, you know, I'm going to actually put some real marketing effort into this, especially as it made it into the finals. I, I had a, a Felix Ortiz do a new cover for it. Mm, he's so <clears> good. And, um, he's amazing now. That was edition number two um, right. on the self-publishing. And then of course, Orbit, Orbit acquired it um, about a year and a half ago. And that's, you know, and that, that this edition for orbit is actually has significant edits is uh 25 longer and and there's been some it's really been amazing that i i know all authors we, we say we don't read good reads and we do <laughs> it's probably not healthy to do it um and we say you know there actually are critiques of the book that had happened in the first it, both through spfbo as well as through its life that um were good good critiques mm. and you know there's also those nagging little details that authors always look back and say yeah i could have done that a little yeah. better <laughs> i was actually able to go back with orbit and go and fix all of those and so it was so so gratifying to be able to do that and be like yes <laughs> um and then addition you know using with orbit's editors being able to actually fix up a ton of a ton of the the book and add add a ton of world building characters. I, I I think I've jumped ahead a little bit. No, know, that's okay. Uh, so that's interesting. So that you know, you've already had an editor go through it yourself. You've worked on it yourself, and you know it's gone out, and then it's been picked up by Orbit. So were the editors looking at things that you hadn't thought of, or was it expanding on things that were just kind of at the back of your mind, thinking, yeah, I'm not, I wasn't ever happy with that, and I needed to tweak it. Yeah. So during the self pub run, I had had beta readers who yeah. were great. And still are great. I, I always I use continue to use the same ones that are our friends. And mm -hmm. um, and then I had a copy editor, but never had I had a professional um, line editor, developmental editor. Mm -hmm. um, so Orbit's team um, uh, with the uh, with the original acquisition um, and the editorial letter, um, they weren't focused necessarily on any critiques. They were looking at it from a total new, uh, fresh perspective that they were able to provide so much. And uh, as opposed to what the common um, fear is for authors when they get traditionally published is, oh no, the editor is going to cut all my my words. Mm -hmm. And this was the opposite. We said, actually, we want you to, <clears throat> here's, we want to take this storyline, add several scenes to that. We want you to, you know, more world building. And I was like, Wow, yes. <laughs> this is okay. exactly, and we're doing that for every book. So that was that was unexpected and and fantastic that they were able to come from a fresh perspective um on that end. Mm, yeah, it's always good having fresh eyes, I think, with an editor because you spend so long years working on a book and it's just kind of you can't see the wood for the trees. So having someone come in and say, I can see what you're trying to do with this, but it hasn't gone all the way to the end, and you're like, Yeah, yeah you're right. But I I can't see it. I'm too close. I need that outside set of eyes to tell me sometimes. Right. And actually having written, because at that point when it got acquired, I had, I'd finished the trilogy. 
And so I have obviously had to pull it all down. Um, the third book barely got any readers because I pulled it down very soon after right. it was published. But looking at it from uh, a macro perspective, um, both with myself as well as the editors, um, it, everything is, is just gelling together so much better. Kind of like, I don't know if, uh, I know some authors will write the entire trilogy. I was going to say, it's like, rare. I know Joe, uh, Joe Abercrombie, Abercrombie does that. Yes. Yes. Um, and he he has the you know where he is, he has the ability to do that. But mm -hmm. I can see why that can be so beneficial because, you know, the scope now. And I, I'm, again, fortuitously able to do this because I have that entire uh, blueprint in front of me now. Mm. Normally, you kind of write that first book, it goes out, you start working on the second when you get to the third, you're like, oh, I, I can't fix How that thing I? in one. Oh, right. OK. And that's what that's the way it was the first time around. Yeah, yeah. The, the closest I've had is uh, I'm working on three and twos in edits. And I suddenly remember something. I can fix something in two, but I can't. Then you go back and do one. It's out. It's done. You know, uh, and it's crazy. And it's also crazy. Um, You know, hiring self pub, you can just going back to running a business. You can hire you're you're hiring people. And anytime yeah. you're you're contracting people, you have to make decisions and, and evaluations based on the quality of the work that they're doing. That's just part of the game. And I had, you know, gotten pretty good folks um, as far as my copy editor. He was from the industry. He did a fantastic job. Um, obviously, the artist did a fantastic job. But, um, you know, with Orbit, it's like next level. Um, some of the, the the number of times they're the number of people that have their hands on it, like you're looking at your copy edits and I'm sure you've had a similar experience. And you're like, how many people you see all the different in the track changes, you see all the different <laughs> names. There's all sorts of different people jumping in there. So many eyes on it. And then th what they're like with the consistency editing, the stuff they're catching, like mm. is especially now that I've gone through book two and they're just catching things because I, again, I'm more of a discovery writer. And this is why I need uh, a team like Orbit behind me, because it's like, well, <clears throat> you mentioned in the previous book that this nation is bordering this nation and you said that they were traveling west but the sun is rising here <laughs> and actually if that's if the sun rose there then that actually this nation should be to the east and i'm just like okay <laughs> oh <laughs> like, yeah uh yeah <laughs> i knew that <laughs> of course it's just incredible i mean the mind it takes i think to do some of those those uh world building um developmental i guess would that be considered line edits um but like mm -hmm. consistency edits are, yeah. are amazing yeah. to me yeah this is it when i what, uh, my, my first two chose you with all with orbit so i had a u.s editor and a uk editor and i'd get kind of notes and be <clears> like <throat> what what you know it's just two sets of people going through it the first stage and then your development letter editorial letter and so on yeah Yes, it's good to have lots of people going through it. And because you spend so much time with it, it's difficult to, to see everything clearly and have that perspective, I think, really helps from fresh eyes. And then you get someone completely new on it again who goes through it and they find things that the other people didn't before. Um, I know yeah. people sometimes moan and they say, oh, the book's full of errors. But I'm thinking, if you knew the number of times and the number of people who've looked through every book, it's it's just you know unfortunate yeah. sometimes. Yes, it's crazy. So tell me, uh, for those who don't think about it, tell tell the readers, the viewers, um, what the Combat Codes is about. Yeah, I should be decent at this. I just uh, went on tour <laughs> in the UK and I, I did this a lot. So you'd think I'd be OK at it, but we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think I, I like to start it from the perspective and because this is not a, a pitch, this is something we can talk about. Yeah. I've always been interested. I know authors say Every author, most authors I've talked to say they usually the seed of the idea can come from world building, character or narrative. Mm -hmm. Like you have like a narrative idea or you have an idea for a specific character or you have an idea for a world. For me, the the world building was the seed. And that was um, how can I create a world um, where instead of wars between nations with, you know, uh, high tech weaponry, um or even swords and sorcery how can i have everything boiled down to single combat between champions and more specifically unarmed combat because i'm a martial artist mm. i love swords and sorcery i love D, &D. 
Um, I love sci-fi, but I, I wanted to see a world where weaponry is not at the forefront and it's just fists Skill. and, and Skill, uh, grappling and bone. <laughs> and I thought, how can I create a world? And so that's where everything, the politics, the diplomacy, um, the, the relationship between the various caste system, um, the hierarchy, uh, it, you know, where the money flows, it's all based on this, this system of, um, you know, they call them Grivar Knights. Um, and they represent their nations, um, and everything is on the line. And so you can imagine it's just kind of a cascade of of uh, what if questions when I was building this world, and then the characters um, stem from that as well as the narrative. Is it lethal combat or not? Um, yeah, for when 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 the the higher the stakes, the the um, more likely it is to be to the death. Um, mm. And then, of course, there are, you know, there's an academy setting in the book uh, where the young um, knights are being uh, trained. And of course, most of the time that those cases would it would be a detriment to the nation that be killing off their own their own, um, you know, to be champions. Mm -hmm. um, but but when it's it, when everything is on the line, of course, uh, the, the life and death is is as well as well. Mm. Mm. I love I love the Olympics. And this kind of reminds me of, you know like war to war <laughs> olympics but with just martial arts uh, right well it, uh olympics are a good inspiration because if you think about any high level athletes i mean a big a big part of this thought experiment was you know think about what nations have done in the past to try to get their athletes better of course we know about steroids and scandals mm -hmm. and who mm -hmm. knows what else um various nations were doing to enhance their and that's just for pride right that's yeah. just but what if what if everything was in line? What if resources and land were on line? <clears throat> what would they do? And that's what you see in the combat codes is in this um, high tech society, these uh, these this cast of warriors is not able to use any technology. It's against their supposed code of honor. The combat codes mm -hmm. is referring to the uh, the code of conduct that they're supposed to follow. And that's been built into their caste system for for a thousand years now. And of course, the the the, the characters start um, uncovering and asking the question, you know, why why are we actually fighting? This is this is interesting. Why have we been indoctrinated? What what is the reason for this? And given that you've been practicing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for I'm gonna guess 20 years now, probably. Exactly. <laughs> oh, <thank you. laughs> I'm turn I'm turning 40 um next this week if <laughs> welcome and, to the um, 40s club it's good it's a good time it's a good time <laughs> yeah it, it's been all right so far a lot a few a few more aches things don't heal as quick but yeah since i was 20 years old mm -hmm. so obviously that and having spent so much time in the martial arts community has fed into how you direct the fights how you think about it and i know you like um martial arts films and, and all that sort of stuff so all of that has obviously gone into making the fight scenes feel dynamic and realistic and interesting and not just there to show off there to move the plot on as well yeah you know um i have been asked that question a lot and i think um any expertise in any um subject matter um certainly lends it, it comes through in the writing as far mm -hmm. as a feeling of authenticity and i have had that feedback but it can also any expertise in any subject matter science physical sports, uh, martial arts can be a detriment as well, if not used correctly, because you can, you can just go on and on. Mm. And end of the, just like you said, the end of the day, any of any action scene uh, needs to act like dialogue or any scene really. And it needs to move. Uh, it has to have stakes um, that, that move the the narrative forward. Mm. Oh, I haven't done martial arts in a long time, so I'm looking forward to seeing <laughs> seeing what uh, this is like. But, did, we, did you practice as a kid? Yeah, so I did uh, Rensikan Judo for three years. I did Shotokan Karate with my dad for like six years. Um, I did Kung Fu for a year when I was about 15 for some reason. And then just teenage years and you kind of just drift away in university and that was kind of it. But yeah. Yeah, still judo, judo is fantastic. And I did Kung Fu when I was 15, too. That's that's a weird coincidence. It must be something in the water <laughs> or or whatever 15 year olds, even though we grew up in different different uh, countries, whatever uh, we were we were looking at. <laughs> I, I miss maybe. judo, to be honest. I think like I read I read some of the interviews and you say about Jiu Jitsu is, is play and it's grappling. And there's something about. I know I know karate's, you know, people say it feels very 
and kung fu it's very kind of balletic and it's very looks like a dance and something but judo and, and jujitsu there's something else about it there's something that karate is more you kind of come together and you separate you come together and you separate but with judo it's like constant contact you're constantly wrestling with the other person using oh it's so and... it's so grappling i like to just group everything wrestling yeah um obviously not not like wwf no, but no, no, real yeah, yeah. you know uh greco, America, style Roman. Uh, greco or yeah. olympic wrestling um and then judo and uh jiu-jitsu uh the, at sambo and you know from eastern europe yeah there's it, actually most cultures if you look back far enough have a grappling um heritage of some sort and mm. it's very interesting and again it, i think it comes back to like the m mammalian instinct um to play if you watch you know meerkats or, or bears or dogs they they wrestle with each other and there's some reason you know to say that they're preparing for you know combat experiences but also there's research that shows it, it decreases um stress hormones and um i that's the reason i do it a mental health is really at this age it's not for you know you could do it for self-defense that's a great reason you can do it for sport which is a great reason getting in shape is a great reason but at, at this point, um, ha practicing it, it's for, for keeping me from being grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Some yes. people run, some people do judo, some people do jujitsu. <laughs> yes, yes. It's a stress release. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I miss it. I miss um, the, the camaraderie. I miss the kind of the interaction thing. I never liked competitions. I never liked, even when I used to do like swimming as a kid, I enjoyed the work more than the we're going to cram everything you've done into like two hours. I just, I didn't enjoy it as much as the day-to-day -day working on your, your skill and just, you know, learning from people or, or groups of people. That's what I enjoyed more, I think, than competition. I mean, do you still compete? I, the last time uh, was when in 2015. Um, and I don't like competition either. I, it changes. I think it can be useful and I don't try to dissuade students or friends or training partners from doing it but first of all your risk of injury be the way you train for competition and compete the risk of injury goes higher you take more right. risks and i don't really want to be injured um I've, I've had a lot of injuries um over the past 20 years it's just inevitable um but uh, you can't play and again for me it comes back to playing like i tell my kids they're going you're going to play with your friends i'm like yeah <laughs> I'm going to play with my friends but, yeah. and you can't have, you can't have a play. I mean, if you're training for competition, you cannot have a playful mindset. And, and then that prevents learning to some extent. You need to just concentrate on your, your a game. You can't be in a learning mindset. And of course, if you're a professional fighter and you really are doing it at the highest level, uh, you, you need to be both. You need to have learning mindset in the off off season. Then you need to have your competition. That's, and that's stressful. It's, it's just stressful for me to, to, to train in that manner mm. so i guess all of this is sort of feeding into the book as well because one of the characters <laughs> is this kind of uh older knight and his body's a bit more broken and he's a bit more beaten up and maybe pulling on some of your own injuries and experiences <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah that grumpy <laughs> he he is a lone wolf character uh, that's kind of a trope that i i love um mm. the lone wolf and cub the father figure character and we see it um you know, Last of Us, Joel and Ellie, yep. or uh, Mandalorian, um, J Din Djarin and, and Grogu, or mm -hmm. uh, uh, Logan, uh, you know, in, in, Wolver in the Logan movie. Yeah, and Laura, Wolverine. yeah, yeah. Logan and Laura. Um, uh, there's so many great examples. <laughs> Rip, Rip, Ripley, Ripley and Newt. There's, yeah, it, Newt it could be a female. It doesn't have to be a, a male character. Ripley yeah. and uh, Newt and Aliens. Um, it's just such a good trope. And um, Murray is is a, a classic of this trope. He's drinking far too much and he's disillusioned with the system of the world uh, as a whole. And he he cannot um, proceed with with his life until he's able to see it with fresh eyes through, um, you know, this 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 kid that he takes under his wing. And but yeah, it's it's definitely his his injuries are a part of me. <laughs> I feel I feel his pain um it, it you know especially practicing combat sports it's your, your body there's no way around it your body takes takes a beating um mm. for sure yeah so did you write so you obviously you, did you plan it as a trilogy or did it change when you started working with orbit the first book you know how how much of the 
trilogy has changed when you've gone from kind of the self-published approach to the now traditional published approach? Yeah, so uh, it was always planned to be a trilogy. Um, the The first book, I don't want like the first book uh, does have an have a, an ending. Yeah, it's not. But there's also um, a lot of potential after the first book ends um, to expand the world. And that's where I see the trilogy. And that's where I'm so excited for. Obviously, I'm excited for the book launch of the first book. But the second book, uh, which is is um, going to be out in in December. Um, so oh, we're wow. releasing. Yeah, we're releasing a book every six months. Yes. Um, so so there's no worry that it's not a completed trilogy and 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 readers will have the second book december uh before the holidays um the second book i'm so excited for people to read because it's you know the first book we have a more as as trilogies typically typically go a more enclosed environment it takes place in a few different settings primarily like a com the combat academy um mm -hmm. as well as a few but but we're not seeing we're hearing about a lot of the world and the figures in the world and the place names but we're not seeing them yet but in the second book, um, through some new POVs, we're really able to expand out into the world and get to see new cultures. And I had so much fun. I, I think people talk about not having fun writing the second book um, I or even not enjoying the middle book in a trilogy. I've always enjoyed middles. I don't know if it's a weird, weird brain thing, but like I always like the middle. For almost always, I like the middle. And it, I think it's because I don't like when things end. Yeah. And starting things is hard. And mm -hmm. so the middles were as a writer, it's where I'm like, I know the characters, I know the world, I can play in the sandbox, I don't have to end everything. And it's less pressure than the final book. Mm -hmm. The final book has that pressure of tying all those threads neatly. And then from a, a reader or viewer perspective, I enjoy the middle because it's the same. I feel like I know the characters. You don't yes. have to invest the energy to get to know them. Like it's hard reading a first book often, especially like in, in a lot of sci-fi fantasy, because there's so many new names. There's mm -hmm. so many new world. And that's that can be preventative for some readers. Um, but the middle book is where like, I'm here with my friends again, I'm reading, I'm reading people I know. So I, I always like middles. Makes sense. Yeah. There's less barriers. If someone enjoyed that first book, they're going to come back for that second book and it's like, okay, we know where we are. And then it's a new adventure with these people. It makes sense. Yeah. And the third one is, is always, I think the most tricky book because you have to tie up everything. I'm doing it now. I'm writing the third book now, my trilogy. I'm going to be doing the third too. So I got, I feel you. <laughs> it's uh, it's like right i've got to land i've got to make the landing i've got to make it all work i've got to make sure the characters you know the arcs feel real and all the rest of it so yeah yeah and having the, the books come out every six months in that first trilogy is always good did orbit did it with my first trilogy too so that people know within 12 calendar months you've got the whole trilogy and it's done and the, none of this oh i'll wait for the books to wrap up it's like it's already written it's coming out so you may yes, as well pick, yes. up, pick it up now and start i think it's it. i think it's a great strategy um yeah. So tell me a bit about the world building, because this book isn't, you know, pure fantasy or pure sci-fi. It's a mix of both. And it's got kind of like magitech. I've heard you describe it as. Yeah, it was actually a big subject of controversy in the uh, SPFBO. Um, oh, uh, I didn't know I about this. In... Tell me. <laughs> yes. Yes. So I got into the finals and um, people seem the, the reviewers and the judges who are fantastic, by the way, they're, you know, putting in their time and to promote these books they are They, uh, they were all in discord over whether the book was actually fantasy. And so this is self published fantasy blog off. It's not yeah. science. Supposedly it's not science fiction. So there was like this, it got, it got fairly heated. I just stayed out of it. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like some people would would like detract my score. They'd be like, oh, I really like this book, but it's not fantasy. So three out of 10. What? <laughs> and then other people were like, it's fantasy. To be honest, it, it's fine that we were able to create this debate um, over it. And then but the person that um, really seemed to sum it up and I trust her. And she gave me my uh, uh, the blurb. Uh, the first blurb for the book was Fonda Lee, mm -hmm. who I'm a fan. I'm a fa I'm a fan of a really big fan of. She's wonderful. And her quote um, said, you know, a science fantasy martial arts extravaganza. And that's what I use when I need a one liner. Now, I just I don't use yes. my own words. I use Fonda Lee's words. Fonda She's, says this. Yes. A science <laughs> fantasy like Fonda Lee says it's science fantasy. But to be honest, I really do feel like that's where it fits in science fantasy. Um, mm. I don't, I, I 
I am heavily influenced. Uh, I played a ton of like uh, Final Fantasy JRPGs, um, like Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy games when I was a kid. And that form of storytelling, like I played those games as much as I was reading. And and those games, you're just in a story. You're just um, a part mm. of a story. So that, the, and one of the things, if you, you'll notice, I don't know if it's, I don't game as much now, but it was always, those games were never pigeonholed into genres. Yeah. Um, like J, JRPGs. So they like Final Fantasy VI or seven. they had these worlds that were combinations of magic and tech, magitech, li- mm-hmm. literally that using those words, <laughs> um, you know, like mech suits um, combined with, uh, you know, summons. Mm-hmm. Um, and that always was something that was just lodged in my mind. And so when I started writing um, the combat codes or anything else, I never came at it saying, I'm going to write science fiction or I'm going to write fantasy. That was mm. never something. I just wrote it and these things were a part of it. Um, so the world of the combat codes um, has tech for sure, okay. um, but it's not, I'm not, I'm not like, I just went on tour with Adrian Tchaikovsky and I'm not at his level of being able to describe anything scientific. Um, so obviously that is how um, I created the world, not from a scientific perspective yeah. in, as far as describing things so um a lot of the tech um is very uh is not uh, indistinguishable from magic um mm-hmm. and and there for example the 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 rings that the fighters um compete in mm-hmm. um are made of different elements um there's various elements in this world um that have somewhat magical properties where they um, are able to influence the fighters within in various ways. So there's like something called um, Auralite, uh, which will make uh, fighters more susceptible to the crowd around them. So if the right. crowd is jeering or if the crowd is rooting them on, they will feed off of that and it will influence them. And if they have not only mastered, if they haven't mastered their ability to, um, you know, be affected by this element and there's another one that will make them feel creative so they'll try new things they'll take risks with various moves um or one that makes them feel anger or rage all, all sorts of things like that and then again it's 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 magic um but it's there's some you know tech behind it star yeah. wars or... well that was it i was about to say yeah the oldest thing i can think <laughs> of that science fantasy is star wars because it's right. like there's spaceships and there's lasers but then there's right. or the do force. do and i would I think yeah. Dune is science yeah, fantasy. Yeah, Dune, my favorite sci-fi novel of ever. It's like, yeah, yeah, there's all this mysticism and weird stuff and the Bene Gesserits and the Kritzat Hagarach and all of that stuff. And yet there's spaceships and navigators and spice and giant worms. And it's like, yeah, I, I understand why bookshops separate things into science fiction and fantasy. And I understand why for readers it can be useful. If you like this, there's another one that's like this. But when you get into the story, I think sometimes some of these things matter less um i think almost any story you could i think you can write any story in a fantasy genre as long as you include certain elements you can do any kind of story and it's the same you know science fiction science fantasy it's fine it all it all works just fine um so i'm looking forward to, to seeing even if you can see the blends because you said some of these things feel the science but they have magic type abilities you know Right, right, right. Or in fantasy books, um, how often do we see technology play into uh, like even a high fantasy book, quote unquote, high fantasy Mm -hmm. um, swords and sorcery? How often do we see technology have some role within those books, within within the world building of that book? So it goes both ways. And yeah, I I mean, personally, that's the type of stuff I love to read that kind of blends the genres a bit um, and not even purposefully, not like now I'm going to blend the genres, but it's just the way the world has been created. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I think it opens more doors in some ways because th- there is still a huge market for very traditional fantasy that's very kind of familiar, but people are, are always looking for new things. And this is like another avenue of introducing different elements. And when I was growing up, there was less, you know, less TV. Less, well, we were growing up, I guess, it was less TV, less games, less all this kind of stuff. It was starting to come, but it was nowhere near as advanced as it was now. So we right. relied on blended things like the dunes, like the Star Wars, to feed our imagination. And we didn't have yes. those lines in the sand. Right. It was nice. 
We're always going to be saying, back in my day. In my day, son, <laughs> things are much better. We didn't have yes. this, this internet. I have been, I've been catching myself saying that to my kids. Like, and I'll be like, <laughs> did I just say that? <laughs> well, I just turned it to my dad. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Grandpa. When they say yeah. that to you, that's it. Oh, yeah. Go self straight happening. to bed. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, we're still young men. Yes, so, yes. I'm I'm like getting up and hobbling around. Get up and go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have the grunting. I I have found myself grunting more when I'm getting up and down. So <laughs> so as you said, book one is out like within a couple of days. Book two is in uh this is coming out in December. So you are you busy now working on the, the first draft of book three? Um, so I need to well, dig redoing into... it, redoing it. Yeah. Yes. So, but there is in each of these new editions, there is an element of full drafting. Um, right. Is the the full edition and then the actual edits. So, um, I'm waiting till the the uh, the clamor and uh, promotion and marketing and and requirements of book one uh, die down a bit, so I can have the time to now because it's hard, as you know, um, going from editing brain to drafting brain. They're two mm -hmm. different brains and then real like real work brain and parent brain it's like which too many brains too many hats too many brains yeah right yeah yeah it's it's I, yeah because i'm gonna get my edits back soon on two and i'm gonna have to put three down and i can't do both at the same time and then once that's gone off then go back to the other one it's the only way yeah the the most intense i will say is was when i was having that first trilogy come out with orbit because one is coming out i'm editing two and i'm writing three and then yeah. you kind of shuffle right. them down and yeah yeah it's right a, it's a lot yeah. it's a lot <laughs> yeah by the time you're you know talking about and promoing one book your brain your mind is fully in in the world of the second book or the third book even yeah yeah by the time this is the life well yeah by the time <laughs> you're promoting and talking about three you'll be on like the second book of the next thing already at that point and people are like Tell right book book three and you're like uh, what was that again? Um... Right, I can't even imagine if it's a different if it's a different series. Like it's one thing if you're in the same world, but if you're in a completely different series, or or uh, yeah, that's that will be interesting. <laughs> I have to be reminded of stuff like from my first book. At this point, I'm like, uh sure, that I, I'll take your word for it. Right, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> I've only got room for one book in my brain at a time that I'm writing. Right, so. man. I don't. I know some writers <laughs> will put together like three books at once. I'm just like, oh, geez. Yeah, it's intense. It's intense. Yeah, yeah. The, the pros and the cons, there are pros and cons to, to traditional publishing, right. as we said, and there's there's fast periods and then there's very slow periods where not a lot happens. And that's when I find the time to write and breathe and stretch and work on things. And then it's quick again and it's slow again. So I got to yeah. get used to it, man. <laughs> I, I mean, have you even started thinking about what next after book three? I have a few uh, projects that I've written in the various time in between that are mm. like just draft, very messy drafts that I, I find helpful to put something down for about a year uh, or more and then just look at it with fresh eyes. So I'm thinking of picking mm. those up and seeing if they're worthwhile and judging them, judging my own words from from my wise one year in the future <laughs> you were you were terrible back then. or maybe it's something worthwhile salvaging um so we're gonna see see there yeah well you would have gone through the process three times at that point in the traditional pr process you know more of what to expect how to look at a book all the feedback right. from your editors that you put into the next project which is the other thing i mean you do it anyway when you write a book and go to the next one you work on it having learned what you've done from the previous ones so You'll be ahead. You'll be ahead when you come to that new project. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, thanks for thanks for coming to talk to me. I'll put links down below. Where everyone can find you on social. They can order the book. They can get the Broken Binding special whilst it's still available. They will be limited, so you're going to have to rush and get one soon. But yeah, uh, thanks for telling us about about your journey in writing, and uh, everyone should go out and check out the Combat Codes. I really appreciate you having me on here, Stephen. It's it's been a, a blast talking to you. It's always good. Um, connecting with not only people in, in the writing community, but other other authors that have had similar experiences. So I, I really appreciate that. No worries. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.